Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, I'm Ruki Nuhal Ravikumar, Director of Education here at Cooper Hewitt, and I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming all of you to this great program. You can tell there are a lot of color enthusiasts in the audience, because every time we have a program on color, we see you. So <laughs> welcome again. I feel like I should have thought this through a little bit better, because on the one day we're talking about color, I'm in black and white. <laughs> Um, but it's an absolute pleasure to have this program here. Uh, you know, an innovative org organization is a learning organization, and that's definitely true of Tea Leaves. They are a company that are continually engaged in learning new things about processes, materials, really every aspect of making tea to the level that they are proud tea nerds. Um, and what's really amazing about them is not only do they continuously engage in learning, but they also teach in the most beautiful and elegant ways by making these amazing films. And so we have found kindred spirits, so even though they are in the business of tea and we're in the business of design, we found that um, we're actually doing a lot of the same things. So it's really wonderful to have this program here tonight We'll do a screening of a film, followed by a panel discussion. Um, and I'm really glad we're talking about color. I hope some of you attended the program earlier this afternoon, led by um, Jen Brocky, who is our acting head of libraries here. And she co-curated an exhibition called Saturated, the Allure and Science of Color, um, not too long ago, ago, which was really extraordinary because we had rare books from the Smithsonian Library, which some of you got to see today. And we paired it with some amazing objects from the Cooper Hewitt's permanent collection to tell really some fantastic stories about color. But today, um, we're talking about the nature of color and the color of nature. And it's really great to do that since we have our nature triennial on view. Um, it is on view all the way through January. So if you haven't seen it, I hope you'll uh, take a moment, there are 62 fantastic projects in this triennial, which explore what happens at the intersection of design and nature. A lot of it looks at the future. There's several speculative projects in there, and it's really pushing us to be um, thinking about design and nature from a less reactive place and a more proactive place. Um, and for those of you who are more than color enthusiasts, but also design enthusiasts. We're also gearing up for National Design Week in a few weeks, which is October 12th through the 19th. And I hope you will all come back. It's a terrific cohort of winners this year uh, in different categories. And they will be here on panels, doing workshops, and several great opportunities to interact with them in our programs. It's also our 20th uh, anniversary for the National Design Awards program, so everything will be bigger and better. Um, there's a day called the Winner's Salon where we have the winners come up and speak, and usually there are three programs, but this year there'll be 20. Uh, we're doing 20 programs, each lasting 20 minutes, so it's going to be a ton of a great experiences, so I hope to see you all again. But without further ado, um, I'd love to get the film started, and then I will invite three wonderful people to the panel. Um, Ezgi Amegroglu, who's uh, the brand manager of Tea Leaves, and sometimes I tell her she's kind of the real boss <laughs> behind the scenes. Um, Laurie Pressman, who's the vice president of Pantone, and uh, Jennifer coleman Brocky, who's the acting head librarian of Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum Library. So, um, without further ado, let's get this film started. You just look at things, just look at everything, the color of that or the shape of that or whatever. You just look at the natural world and, you know, it's not like I'm making bullets or something. Some of it's just pleasure, like looking at food and appreciating that aspect of the eating experience, you know. You may have 20 
need 30 people working on the same thing. How do you make sure that everybody's on the same page? You need a language of color. Color can set the career of a company. If Coke, Coca-Cola changed from that red to like some kind of like, mm, it's kind of a dull brown, they're gonna go out of business. It's that, wow! Right? That happens and it's on the back of your tongue. And is that red? Absolutely. Because you don't see cola tips color. Cola's, color's boring. You see that red color that they've associated. Ninety-five percent of what happens is really out of your frame of consciousness. You're not even aware of it. Ninety-five percent of what influences with you with color is emotional. It's not rational. Only five percent is rational. Especially in context with information. You know, I could put the word happy. If I put the word happy like in like a weird, you know, like off black against black, well, it's not going to mean happy. It's going to mean some weird inverse ironic statement of happy. You know, at one period of time, a, a significant portion of the food supply was unsafe. If something was not the right color or didn't smell right, it was, that was a cue that we were not to eat it. So, I mean, that's, you know, that there, there have been evolutionary rules, uh, reasons for us to be able to make those distinctions over time. How do you make it in a different way um, that, that is familiar, but at the same time, Consumers are a little kind of surprised with, well, how did, exactly did you do that? When you're looking at a product in a store, three seconds, do I like it, do I not? If do I not like it, I'm gonna walk away, not interested. There are many products that are well-designed that can not get the traction they deserve because the color's not right. Color plays into it, texture plays into it, graphics play into it. All of that is part of the fluidity of creating this amazing product. At the same time, when it's done, people would say, I, I, I want to be seen in that. Especially in track and field, more than any other Olympic sport, it's all around how, how dominating do you look? And down to the point where in preparing for an event. If you watch, they come out with like five or six layers of clothes on, even if it's 85 degrees out. And they slowly take away, they're, they're slowly taking sort of the covers off to get down to the armor, which is the final layer. And so you're watching your competition back and forth of what do they got on under there, you know? what's Sometimes even the shoes are covered. Or they put on a final pair right when they're down to the level. But for Safa Pal, so many of these athletes, especially at Olympics want colors that match to their country. So he's from Jamaica and the colors are, are green, yellow, and black. And what he wanted was the plate to be gold for a very specific reason. He viewed himself as the fastest you know, animal in the world out there. And of course, cheetah was the one that is the fastest, you know, can do 60 miles an hour. So he said, you know, let's do a cheetah pattern that mimics this animal that I am so sort of fond of and, and, and studied. And when you get into really studying the cheetah print, through the head and the ears, it's a very small pattern and then it expands as the body goes back. So the, the size of the ellipses, they're not circles, they're ellipses, uh, up through the ears and the nose and the neck are maybe a third the size as they are through the back of the body. So, you know, we studied, we went to the zoo and you look at the cheetahs and you look at the, okay, explain them and you, and you can kind of um, uh, really get a feel for how sometimes nature really makes things look fast when maybe they aren't. So the cheetah looks fast standing still. So that's what we invoked into the shoe. And the colors, we tried a range of things, but those colors are hard to work with because, well, if when we, and we talked earlier, when you do black, too much black, it looks slow. And we picked that up right away. So there were a range of colorways that were done. The white one is the one, and we put it in the tip because, again, when you're watching top down, I'm seeing white, lightweight, almost angel like with this cool print. And then the darkest color is in the back of the heel, which then comes back up through the leg. So it almost looks like that green just flows back up through a sock and then into the, the, the power of the leg. Look at me. Look at how cool I am. Don't I scare you? And that was all part of it because you'd look at, well, look at those shoes. Why well, he's really got to be fast if he's putting that stuff on and he's all hooked. And all of a sudden, God, did I train hard enough? Can I beat this guy? 
And so it's all about trying to put just a hint, a hint of doubt in your competitor. Because the track and field stuff, it's a tenth of a second. It's that fast. Silver, silver to bronze, I mean gold to bronze, it's that fast. Tenths of seconds. So any slight doubt I can put into your mind it, it is, is I've already won and we haven't even gone into the blocks yet. In the design process, uh, part of my goal has always been to think about it at the very beginning. One of the things that I think is a mistake is to use color as a band-aid. To act as if it can come in at the end and you're just going to tape over it and it's going to say something that you wanted to say. Well, when I compose a dish at Juni, what it's about is first it's about the season. So what happens is that season generally gives you different color profiles to be able to use. So as we get into summer, we use orange, we use red, we use all those beautiful summer colors. As you progressively go into fall, it's mushrooms and it's darker colors, and then winter turns into this aspect of black and white. So just by changing the things that people are thinking about that the color reminds them of, you can actually change their preference for the color. So say we have a specific shade of red and we show you lots of um, strawberries and ripe fruit and flowers that are as positive and associated with red, you'll come to like red more than someone that we show blood and guts and lesions that are negatively associated with red. Like, look, I want to bring back all the color. I want to bring back like fantasy and whimsy and humor. You know, you could have the same object be different colors and some colors you, you, just, you have to touch it, you have to pick it up, you know. And once you pick something up, then it's got you. So OPI got into color in 1989 and we looked at the nail polish category and uh, it was really just a number and a color. It didn't have personality, it wasn't aspirational, it wasn't fun or sexy. We at OPI realized that that was missing. Th the most asked for uh, question from every editor in the world is, how do you come up with those names? It happened, I was at a wedding at the Natural History Museum and this young lady who was pouring wine <laughs> actually missed the glass and half of it was pouring down my dress. And she said to me, I'm not really a waitress, I'm an actress. I'm like, oh my God, have I got something for you. And the name I'm not really a waitress was born, which is kind of a candy apple red. It's a great red because it really fits all skin tones. It really said to women, you can be anything you want to be. You know, I'm not really a waitress. I'm an, an editor. I'm a flight attendant. I am a, a mom, a homemaker. I'm an executive. So everybody could relate to that color. And it really said to women, you can be anything you want to be in this world. It gave them permission to, to wear nail polish and, uh, and say, look at me, here I am. Uh, Lincoln Park After Dark uh, from the Chicago Collection, a color that really revolutionized uh, how women look at perceived color, where dark nail polish became chic and wearable. You know, before if you wore dark color, it was really kind of very grungy and uh, not for everybody, but you know, dark color became mainstream. People ask me, who do you design shades for? And I say for my daughter who's 22, my mom who's 93, and everybody in between. When we would do concept work, there would be all kinds of colors that you would just sketch up a range of things. And, and you, would, you could influence a decision of desire by color. So oftentimes we just went to kind of shades of gray to, to really emphasize on the design first, the lines and the proportions and sort of the, the symmetry of the design, and then bring color in. So I usually will think about the color before I even think about the design, especially like planning out the product line for the company. Because, you know, we're going to release something like 120 different products over the course of the year, and the ideal customer is a collector that has them all. So I had to think about what's it all going to look like together on a big shelf. I have to pull back and I have to listen. So with my process, what I want to understand is 
what that color needs to do in order to make it have a connection. So what I try to do is to be empathic to a situation, empathic to a need, empathic to a place, empathic to a person. We don't want the items to be the same shapes, but we can carry through like themes in color and or ranges of color or feelings or counterpoint like this one's white, this one's black together. They look, you know, there's a lot of that thought out too. So I have a giant wall laid out with either all the products we're gonna make or an exemplar that's close to it, just so you can see a rhythm of color and pattern across the whole thing. And if the whole wall is pleasing to look at as an entity, then I know that it's worked. We made a decision to start a color of the year program, for lack of a better word, when we saw how much angst there was around the new millennium coming up. Is the world gonna fall apart? Uh, <laughs> is my computer gonna break down? What's gonna happen? You know, you had that half of the population, the other half going, how exciting, we're moving into 2000. No matter what goes on in the world, we're always looking at it, here's what's taking place now. What does that mean for color? How do we take this message and communicate that out in the language of color? Because essentially that's what Pantone is, the language of color. What we came up with was Cerulean Blue because we felt that this color best expressed what was taking place and what really what people needed. We look at a lot of different industries to get this, particularly, you know, industries that are long lead, movies, media, what's coming up in 2020. You know, and in the case of coming up with Marsala, it was a very conscious effort with a color that was different than what people would typically expect because the past couple of years have been brighter shades. You think about the brights, it was honeysuckle pink and a, I said a mimosa and tangerine tango, emerald green was really about unity and bringing people together, radiant orchid, freshness, newness, unique and modern. And where are people now? We're having technology coming at us. We're going crazy. We want to de-stress. We want to unplug. We want to do yoga. We want to meditate. We want to decompress. We want to turn off. We want something a little bit more muted. And when we saw the shade and it was Marsala, we thought, okay, that's really good. Number one, it brings to mind the Marsala region in Italy. And so you're thinking wines, even though it's not a drinkable wine, it's a cooking wine, but it also plays into where are we? We want things that are gonna feed us. We want things that are gonna nurture us. So what better way? It's not just feeding our soul spiritually, it's also feeding our soul physically. We may be talking about all these different colors and then you have a cataclysmic event. That's the thing that can rock the world of trend. If I go back to the financial crash, all of a sudden you could see it's like my eyes could close and you knew there were going to be neutrals on the selling floor. You just knew it because all of a sudden people are going to be nervous about spending money. I'm going to spend my money on things that are investments, things that are neutral stay that stand the test of time. But I, I think the, the, our team at Pantone who's coming up with color trends have been doing this for a very long time. They're very attuned to what's happening and you can't divorce trend from the culture. Everything is so interwoven in what's taking place. Around 2003, I was playing Ultimate Frisbee at a tournament in Santa Cruz, California. And uh, I was wearing a pair of glasses that I, I had actually manufactured in my laboratory that were made out of glass that I had melted and ground and everything. And I was selling these to local laser surgery companies for the surgeons to wear to protect their eyes during laser surgery. And the word had got back to me that the surgeons were stealing the glasses and using them as sunglasses. So I had this vision of them driving around their Maseratis and Ferraris with their sunglasses on up and down the coastal highway of California and I thought that's cool I should do that too. So I had them at the tournament and a friend of mine said can I borrow your sunglasses he put them on and I didn't know it at the time but he was colorblind and he said oh I can see the cones. He couldn't actually see the fluorescent orange cone on the green background they were the same color but when he put the glasses on you could see them. Things like, I can see the red traffic light, I can see the red stop sign, I can see the green leaves from the brown leaves. And 
it's, this, this might seem really mundane, but I get the biggest thrill of walking around with somebody who is trying the glasses on for the first time and observing how they interact with the world differently. Uh, and it goes something like this. What? Is that lavender? And then you might, I'm immediately thinking as a scientist, like, how do they know what lavender is? Well, if I had to define lecture, I'd say uh, that it, in lecture, it's really the details that matter. Um, and in particular, I would say that color is so important in what we do, uh, whether it be from the inside of the packaging, so that's from the tea leaves themselves to the color of the actual fusion that the tea leaves uh, make, um, to the exterior of the packaging. So what's going to entice, make you excited about actually trying the different teas, uh, which is why we, we partner with Pantone to help us with our exterior packaging of the teas to make it exciting to you. In the culinary world, there is a saying that as tea blenders, we take very seriously, and that is the first taste is with the eyes. So as a result, when we custom blend our teas for our clients, we treat color just as importantly as we do taste and aroma. So in iced teas, you actually lose the aroma. So one of the, the three major components that we take into account in a hot tea, which is color, aroma, and taste, in iced tea, you actually lose out on the aroma. So you only have color and taste to take into account. As a result, that elevates color even to a higher status than it would be even in hot tea. And industry standards for blending iced teas currently is actually very dark and very saturated. However, for ourselves, we actually want to make something that looks super tasty and very exciting and enticing for people. So we actually blend it uh, lighter liqueuring and more amber in, in tonality so that when it's poured over ice, it actually is reminiscent of something like a great scotch. And I mean, who doesn't like a great scotch? <laughs> Even though we may do details like blending for color, which people may or may not recognize or know that it's there or that's affecting them on any intimate level, that we know it's there and that we know it has an impact of some sort. You can be influenced by what's going on, okay? You can like get energy from it and have it trigger thoughts, but if you're just gonna mimic what you see is going on now, by the time it comes out, People will like, well, he's just copying that shit or whatever. There is this fear that we're going to do it wrong. And honestly, the only thing we would really do wrong would be to not play or to not understand what each of these things could do just by shifting it subtly. So my encouragement with any designers I'm working with, with any company I'm working with, is to try to engage in that form of play. How does what we're doing, the product, from a color point of view, accessorize with everything else that's going on. What's your color strategy? If you design toward human value, that you will have far longer reach and a deeper connection than you ever could to trend. So I think that one of the bigger obstacles that I have is trying to communicate to um, my client why we're doing something. You know, I guess why the question is why do we continue to do things that maybe people may or may not notice or appreciate or why it's at a financial disincentive really for us to be doing these things. Um, taking a lot of these details into account, you know, why do we continue to do them when there's a lot of reasons not to be doing them? And I think the reason is like, why does an artist go to their easel every day and try and paint something better than what they did the day before? Um, why do people try and, you know, elevate or do better in their marathons uh, every time they run and I think it's it's you know personal pursuit of perfection and inside it we all know it's the right thing to do. Hello everyone, 
Um, good evening. Welcome to our panel, Nature of Color. And thank you for choosing to be here tonight among all other options of what you could do tonight. Um, thank you to our wonderful friends at Cooper Hewitt and Pantone. It's, it's such a pleasure to partner with them. At Tea Leaves, we're, we're tea blenders by trade, and we've learned that in, in luxury. It's the details that matter. In our collaborative project with Pantone, it was an exploration of culture, mood, color, knowing that mood has extremely strong affiliations uh, with tea as well as with color. So throughout our color exploration from, from the inside and out as we worked on our packaging, it was one of the first projects I worked on, uh, we wanted to share our learnings by filming this documentary um, in our in-house film department. And it's called Color Insight. And two of the stars in our documentary, Laurie Pressman and Frank Kozik, um, are here with us tonight. And Frank Kozik is the legendary chief uh, creative director of Kid Robot. Um, I'm so honored to be moderating this panel with these two lovely women tonight, and I'd love to call them up. It's uh, Lori and Jennifer Coleman-Brock. <laughs> Jennifer is the acting head librarian of Cooper Hewitt, Smithsonian Design Library, one of the 21 branches of Smithsonian libraries, and a leading repository of European and American design and decorative arts uh, in the nation and the world. Yeah. <laughs> With 20 years of experience at Cooper Hewitt, Jen has a background in digital imaging and has led numerous digital initiatives for the museum and the library. She curated her first exhibition, Color, in a new light in, uh, between February 2016 and May 2017 for Smithsonian Libraries at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. She co-curated the expanded exhibition, Saturated, uh, the Allure and Science of Color, which I had the pleasure of uh, visiting for Cooper Hewitt. She enjoys exploring the intersections of art and science and providing access to as much information as possible. Lori um, is the vice president of the Pantone Color Institute, the world's most comprehensive destination to gain intelligence, insight, and implications on the science and emotions of color. She's involved in the development of Pantone's color research and color trend forecasting products and services as the managing editor of Tones, Pantone's color newsletter. Oh, it's old now. <laughs> Additionally, she sits on the Home Products Board for Fashion, Institute of Technology, the Fashion Advisory Board at Savannah College of Art and Design, and is the Vice Chairman of the Color Standards Committee for Color Marketing Group. So hi. <laughs> Knowing that uh, what's going on in Cooper Hewitt now, I thought it would just be very interesting, this is very quick, just to talk about color and trend uh, and nature of color, color of nature, and I guess the role of trend in between all of that and how today we are so much more tied into nature and influenced by nature in terms of the colors that we're looking for. So color is a language. I think you got that from the film, right? Color is a language. It's a way we express ourselves. Color is also inextricably tied to the culture. We use the language of color to express who we are, how we feel, and to symbolize the message we want to send to the world. With nature top of mind for so many, it makes perfect sense that some of the key colors we are seeing today are coming directly from nature. Nature is a true innovator. It's a it is something that inspires all industries from creative design to logistical engineering. Nature's color and perspectives influence the way we relate to the world around us, effortly achieving all the design goals that humans set for themselves and strive to reach beauty, functionality, circularity. There's ruthlessness as well as beauty in nature's what we would call their super efficient circular systems. But at the same time, nature's infinite variation, irregularity, and flexibility is something we can emulate. I'm thinking one of the images got lost in the transmission here, so I apologize for that. Uh, something that we see through the color, the material, the form of our creations. But when you think about it, why is it that we are seeing visual elements tied to nature becoming increasingly important to design thinking? And they are. What is it that these visuals are saying to us that seems to be resonating with us so deeply? Is it the realization that our natural resources are being destroyed that's getting our attention? 
Or do we unconsciously understand that we get energy from nature, that it fuels our mind and body, enriches our soul? This is the story of the transmission between a PC to a Mac. So I apologize because I can see that one of the visuals, and this is what happens, you lose the visuals. For those of us who work on a PC, we see this, and I'm sorry we didn't test it before, so I'm really sorry for that. In our response, picture this, nature. <laughs> In our response to nature, then being guided by our focus on health and self-care and our desire to connect back to ourselves and live a more healthy and natural lifestyle. Picture this woman stretching on this deck because that's what she's doing as she's doing her yoga. Maybe it's a result of our increasingly digitized lives, one is that experienced through a flat screen, one that's devoid of the warmth and texture of physical touch. Or this whole idea of experiencing a virtual reality instead of enjoying a physical reality. Or the push to robotics in the greater galaxy. Maybe for city dwellers, it's the concrete jungle packed with people with barely a hint of green or anything organic and natural that's driving this thirst. And lest we forget, maybe it's a 24-7 lifestyle, which many of us are living, one where we are completely overloaded, that is driving this desire to sync with nature. Or possibly it's all of the above, for there's nothing that conveys freedom, fun, and the ability to completely decompress than thoughts of being in nature. Trend, of course, plays a big role in color choices as trend is all about relevancy. And as we look at trends in color for spring, summer 2020, nature is calling. And yes, I agree with Laura Guido Clark. It's not always about looking at a trend color. What my goal was here tonight was to highlight trend, but really to highlight what's taking place on a macro level and how that then gets communicated out into the world of color. And I don't know that people always are aware of that. People that are working in color, of course, see that because we all pay attention to it. So I'm sharing that. <laughs> so we talk about reflecting the sustenance and nourishing balance we're craving, as well as the need to rejuvenate. It makes sense that the greens, a color family symbolic of the physical beauty and inherent unity of the natural world, are the first color family that comes to mind when we think of nature physiologically affecting the nervous system, causing us to breathe slowly and deeply, helping the heart to relax by slowing the production of stress hormones. This color family, which we refer to at Pantone as nature's neutral, helps us to revive, restore, renew. When we think about the greens, it's always the re words, refresh, restore, revitalize, the re, re, re. This is a good reason why you see more and more cities creating parks. We've been seeing this for a long time already where people can take a reinvigoration break during the day or injecting green smack into the middle of the city. Even if surrounded by buildings, our bodies still immediately react both physiologically and psychologically to the presence of green, helping to soothe our eyes, calm our souls, so keeping this in mind, it makes sense, right, that products directly reflecting shades and patterning from nature's greens are resonating across the color spectrum. Along with the greens, we talked earlier about nature and the texture of nature. We're seeing the patterning of leaves illustrating this texture and the intrinsic beauty of nature also becoming more prominent as well. But it's not just about the greens in nature that we connect to at this base level, it's also the blues, long associated with the serenity of the blue sky over a calm sea below. The light, the mid-tone, and deep blue shades bring feelings of a quiet and a cool permanence. Open and expansive, these reassuring and restful blues evoke trust and dependability, all of which in turn engender feelings of contentment, certainly a desired feeling in our turbulent world <laughs> without getting political. Continually turbulent world. <laughs> Everyday turbulent world. Front and center today are the light and the airy blues conveying a message of mobility. These blues speak to our desire for freedom. This is something we really began to see at the beginning of, of the 2000s, but more so and more so today when you think about how certain people are living, they're renting, they're not owning, it's Airbnbs, it's Ubers, it's nobody wants to make a permanent investment. And when you think about the blue that symbolizes that, it's really the light and the pale shades that we think about. 
When we think about the watery teals and the turquoise inflected blues, this is all about escapism and joy. You don't completely get this here. You can see the relationship, but when you think about it, you see that the Mediterranean Sea, you see something like that, right away you're, you're there. You just feel like you're on that beach, you're in that place. We've also seen a continued interest in floral. This is another trend that is not going away. It continues and continues throughout all different areas of design. This is another way we express our affinity for nature. Again, it's a trend that's continuing importance, showing up in so many different product categories, in so many different ways, and in so many different color patterns, color ways as we call it, as well as in some less typically expected places. Mineral colors and patterning reminiscent of mountainous landscapes and rock formations are another way in which we see nature being brought in. Also looking at the faded looking taupey browns, again, reflecting the earth itself. Same reason why we see the burnt orange tones that are coming through. Again, it's about this connection, going back to nature, going back to the roots, going back to the wilderness, going back to this desire to disconnect and just connect with something that's real, you know, versus sitting at that screen all day, see and feel and physically touch something else. So it's turning off your mind and, and looking to colors that are organic, transparent and honest. And I briefly do want to touch on color of the year, uh, which was color of the year 2019, which was living coral. When we first made the decision, so my role there is uh, Pantone Color Institute was started in 1986. It was founded on the basis of consumer color preference studies. And at the time, Larry Herbert was a family owned company, felt it was important to have a foundation. It wasn't just about a book of color. It's like, why do we have these colors? What do these colors mean? So whether it was our palette for print or our palette for fashion, home and interiors, there had to be a story behind it. Color of the Year did start in 1999. Part of it was we wanted to start a conversation around color. And the other part of it was people always asking, what's the one color? There's never one color. <laughs> It's never just one color. It just doesn't work like that. But we felt this is a good way to get everybody talking about color and to get everybody to understand that color is a language. Color reflects what's taking place in the culture at a moment in time. So we really look at ourselves. It's a global team. It's a trend team. But a lot of our role is education and helping people understand the power of color and how to leverage color to really be able to convey your message, whether it's brand, visual identity, or product. So 2019, Living Coral really was top of mind for us what was taking place in nature. You know, it didn't get, we didn't want to take a position as an environmental company. We are not, we're a color company, but we really felt there was a strong message here. And just as coral reefs are a source of sustenance and shelter for sea life, we felt this vibrant shade, yet at the same time, a mellow shade embraced us with the warmth and nourishment to help provide comfort and buoyancy in our continually shifting environment. You get that turbulence, right? It's still there. Sociable and spirited, there was also an engaging feeling to living coral that welcomed and encouraged lighthearted activity uh, and the enjoyment of spending time with others and having fun. In our Color of the Year program, our messaging tends to evolve because except for those cataclysmic events, things tend to evolve over time, right? You don't go like this. Now do you go like this, like this. But when you look at color, I, I, I'm joking, but when you, things tend to just move along. You know, it grows, it builds, and, and that kind of thing. It's not always so drastic or dramatic. And just because things are turbulent, it doesn't mean we don't want to go out and have fun. And this was also a color that really spoke to, again, you know, shutting down the computer, go out, have some lighthearted activity, bring some fun into your life. It was a color that really spoke to our innate need for optimism and joyful pursuits, very important, embodying our desire for playful expression, a trend we've continued to see, this whole desire to play. And at the same time, a color whose humanizing and heartening qualities played into our quest for comfort and reassurance amidst this continued unrest and uncertainty and instability. And if you look around what you see today, you see a lot of softer shapes, softer materials, warm and softer colors because people are looking for that comfort. And to really sum this up and to sum up color of the year, when we think about this program, it's a symbolic snapshot of what's taking place in our culture, our global culture at a moment in time. It's a color for us that we see crossing all areas of design that serves as an expression, a mood, uh, and an attitude on, a, on the part of the consumers, a color that we feel will resonate around the world, a color that reflects what people are looking for, what they feel they need, that color can help to answer. And then I would tell you to stay tuned for December 5th, 20, 2019, when we announce our Pantone Color of the Year for 2020. Because <laughs> Living Carl only goes so long. It'll last this year. <laughs>
then we'll be on to the next. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Is this working? Um, I'm really excited to talk to you all tonight about one of my favorite topics, color. Um, as mentioned, I had the privilege of curating an exhibition about the topic. Um, but first, let me just tell you that I am the head of the Cooper Hewitt Library, and we are open to the public. If you didn't know we have a library, I welcome you. Um, you just have to make a reservation, and we'd be happy to show you all of our treasures. So we have two lovely reading rooms and 100,000 books uh, on design, of course. And we also have 15,000 rare books and special collections. Um, some of you got to see those earlier tonight in person on color. Uh, and you're going to see some of those again on the slides. So the exhibition Saturated was actually inspired by a smaller show that I curated for Smithsonian Libraries that was at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC. Um, of course, we had to include Pantone, noted on the wall, very prominently placed there, their fan deck. Uh, <laughs> so both of these color exhibitions were actually inspired by Cooper Hewitt's amazing collection of rare books on color, ranging from color theory, dye recipes, color trend books, and paint samples, to name a few. The saturated exhibition covered a variety of topics related to color, and for this presentation, I've selected those most connected to nature. I also want to note that all these books have been digitized, so you can browse them from home or wherever you connect to the internet from cover to cover. Starting with the theme capturing color, which displayed many uh, books with color models that had been created over hundreds of years, um, the oldest color model that we featured was created by a naturalist named Moses Harris. Harris was an entomologist. He studied insects. And he created this color wheel in 1776 and used it to help with the identification of insects. Color was and still is used as a major trait for identifying and categorizing different species of insects, animals, and plants. Here is another example of a naturalist using color as an identification tool, this time for birds. This one was created in 1912 by Robert Ridgway, Smithsonian's first ornithologist. Ridgway was dissatisfied with the existing color standards of the time, so he set out to create his own. A true pursuit of passion, he devoted over a decade of his life to creating this expanded second edition, which features over 1,000 colors, all hand cut and pasted in each volume, volume in his kitchen by him and his wife. This example also has lots of fun names, uh, including dragon's blood and elephant's breath. Uh, in this section, Creating Color, we featured many objects showing the variety of materials used to create the different colors um, using natural or synthetic dyes. So this book um, is from 1794, called The Wiener Farben Cabinet. It's one of only four copies known in the United States. This early manual describes the preparation of colors um, it includes 2,592 hand-colored natural dye specimens and is organized according to color, starting with black. It includes color recipes along with the details of how to apply these dyes to silk, cotton, wool, leather, bone, um, and many other materials. An interesting note about this one is that we scanned it. And with our scanned books, we used OCR, what is called optical character recognition, which is that magical thing that allows you to keyword search a text online. But that doesn't work with this kind of font or typography. It's a German black letter. Um, so computers still don't pick up on that very well. The Smithsonian Transcription Center was available for us to use. And literally within six months, these 1,000 pages were transcribed by volunteers across the world. Um, so you still have to know German. But at least you can plop that German text into your translator, too, if you don't know it. Um, so being so rare, it provides this new level of access to an important work that 
um, people still use today, especially in the conservation world where conservators on a daily basis are dealing with the old mysterious materials that went into dyes. So these lovely objects are from Cooper Hewitt's amazing textile collection, and we use them to tell the story of the invention of synthetic dyes. The garment on the left is a huipil, or woman's blouse, from Mexico. The magenta threads are colored with this shellfish dye from a sea snail. Mixtech men activate the snail's defense mechanism by manually, they pluck it from the side of a, like a cliff along the ocean, they agitate its gland, it squirts out this ink, um, they run the cotton threads through it, exposure to light, it starts turning purple very quickly. Um, so this is an extremely labor-intensive process, as you might imagine, which also means it's very expensive, um, and it requires thousands of sea snails to make a small amount of colored thread. Archaeologists have excavated pits of these crushed shells in the millions, revealing humans' desire for this vibrant purple goes back to ancient times. The object on the right, a mid-19th century silk scarf, which is very similar in color to the hui peel, is an example of one of the earliest synthetic dyes. In 1856, an 18-year-old chemist, William Henry Perkin, accidentally discovered the first synthetic dye while using coal tar, a byproduct of the Industrial Revolution, while searching for a cure for malaria. His experiment failed, unfortunately, for malaria, but it left behind an oily residue that stained silk a brilliant color of purple that he called movine. Synthetic purple dyes soon took the fashion world by storm, not to mention it also was a game changer in that it brought, the industri it brought chemistry into the industrial world, which paved the way for the development of pharmaceuticals, explosives, plastics. So a real changing moment, all for our desire for color. So, with the invention of synthetic dyes comes the rise of the idea of color harmony. Um, now that people had access to all the colors of the rainbow at their fingertips um, and at a price they could afford, they were putting together many color combinations that perhaps were new, considered garish by some. <laughs> So you have an opportunity for tastemakers of the day who felt the need to provide guidance to prevent what they considered these garish combinations. One of these tastemakers was an architect and decorator, Edward Guichard, who promoted the concept of color harmony for the design of wallpaper, draperies, upholstery, and paint schemes. His Harmony of Colors from 1882 contains 166 spectacular full-colored plates with 1,300 harmonious color palettes intended to inspire his fellow designers. And this can be considered an early precursor to what is known today as color trend books. So those are just a few highlights from the library's rare book collection that demonstrate the close relationship between color and nature. Whether looking to nature to inspire a greater understanding of color or having color teach us more about nature, the two are inseparable and will continue to influence new discoveries and an understanding of the world around us. Thanks. As designers and artists and humans, why are we so inspired by nature? <laughs> um, I, my specialty is more with the history. <laughs> so I think it's undeniable that we're inspired by nature and I'm not gonna question why, we just are and it's there and it always will be. So, and color is right there with it. I would say, no, I'm, I'm kind of right there with you. It's real. I think it's something we naturally respond to. It just touches us, and it's something we connect to. I don't know that I question it either. I think it's just, it's a part of the natural beauty of the world. So that would be my short and long answer. <laughs> so let's move a little bit into history, I guess. So, you know, throughout time, 
how would you describe how our appreciation of color um, has evolved throughout time? There's lots of theories we discussed over our call as well that were really interesting. How has that changed over time? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think our relationship with color has evolved over time uh, from exactly what you were referring to when we think about the snails and how difficult it may have been to access color over time. And yet I think people were fascinated by color from the beginnings of time. You know, when you look back and you see how they, whether it was color, you know, dirt from the earth or all these different ways that they found to extract dyes and create color. So color was always a language, and I think there was always, as time went on, and you still see it today, the discovery of new colors and how can I use color to express myself. So to me, color is life. And I don't know how to describe this any better, is that it's a further exploration of how do we find another way to express ourselves. I don't know if that's the right answer. <laughs> I'd love to a, like a right answer. I'd love to compare kind of, you know, why do the twenties look so different than the eighties? Why did the fifties look so different than now? And is there is there a connection between trends or culture or history or perhaps it's technical um, that these tastes have changed over time? You know, why were the eighties so bright? You know? <laughs> Not that I was around. Trends in color reflect the culture. I mean, that's something I, I think if you spent time with me, with anybody on my team, that would be so clear. It's a language, and it's even just what I was saying at the beginning. It, it's, there are these macro trends. They get expressed into the world of color. I, you know, we say there's a, a book that would come out through the Pantone Color Institute, uh, Pantone 20th Century in Color, written by my colleagues, Leitra Seisman and Keith Recker. And in there, you would clearly see a line that speaks to, you can trace back history over time and be able to figure out what was taking place by the trends that were happening at that time. So if you think about the 20s, the 20s was about the jazz age. It was about rebellion. It was about the flappers. It was about women getting the right to vote. Yay. You know, all of these things, of course, were before the crash, but it was a time of... of Again, rebellion, prohibition may have been taking place, but people were trying to drink anyway and find different ways to do it. So the colors that you're seeing at that point, you had Art Deco you know, that came into being in the 20s, were colors that reflected those times. Uh, if I think about uh, the 80s, I think about greed, I think about empowerment, I think about people wanting to do things better, I think about Reagan, I think about Dynasty, I think about Dallas. You know, the preppy hand. But that's what you think about, right? You think about the preppy handbook. It was a time where people were spending money. People were joyous. People were positive, you know, for a good part of that decade. So I think the color stories that you see really reflect that. When I think about some of the big discrepancies, not discrepancies, but where you could see a real shift is, is you know, the 40s and 50s, where you had the 40s and you had the war going on. So how were pe what were people feeling? What were people seeing? And then you move into the 50s, where people were coming back from the war. They were starting new jobs. They were moving into these planned communities. You know, there was more of a happiness. You started to see the shift in cultural perception of the pink, shifting to women with Think Pink and Funny Face. But I think that, to me, is where, where when you look at decades and you compare things, I think now where you are, you know, yes, you could probably relate back to decades. I think now we're, we're always reaching back to the 70s, the 80s, and 90s, what was happening then, the color stories and trend. I think things are being cycled back so much more quickly now because of social media and everything. Our lives are moving so quickly. So what was old that comes, comes back much more quickly than it did in the past. But I think of where we are now, I, I think we're at a place where it is about natural. It is about being organic. You know, we're reaching to nature for inspiration, all different areas of nature for those color stories, whether it's the flora, whether it's the succulents, whether it's the plants, whether it's the sea, whether it's the earth. Uh, you're also seeing, I think, a whole story of saturated brights because of social media and the vibrancy, but that's a separate piece. It was a big ramble. No, that I was hope perfect. It was helpful. No, was... <laughs> 60s, you could talk about the drug culture, you know, the psychedelics and the influence of color. You know, there's always, it's a marriage. 
love it. You can keep going. <laughs> I grew up with an avocado green fridge, and oh, I never God, understood yeah. no, but, but now, how that could have happened. No, but, now, you see, but, but that goes back to, so that's interesting, because if you think about that, Harvest Gold and avocado, right, the 70s, and, and I can relate. <laughs> but you might not want to call it that today. So how do you change people's perception about color? You change it by the name. You know, is the name more current? The minute you hear avocado green and harvest gold, you're right back in the 70s. So you probably would call it something differently. And you would, you would harmonize those colors differently. You would juxtapose that same, you know, what you may call now uh, guacamole instead of avocado green with maybe it's a vibrant purple, you know, red-based purple, something else that you would have a completely different, uh, it would influence you in a different way. You'd perceive it in a different way. That, that's how you keep reinventing color, I think. I don't know, but I think we're so trained on that harvest gold and avocado green cheese. <laughs> Why do you think that was so in vogue in those times? Earthy colors. I mean, that was a time of the earth movement, you know? So you saw the, the relationship. Uh, I mean, you saw in the 60s, the whole earth movement really started coming. I think it was 1970 when Earth Day started. Was that it? And I forget the name of that wonderful woman who wrote that great book, and I should know this, and I forget off the top of my head, but you saw the focus on the environment. So here, too, once again, you see the reflection of what's taking place and, and those colors spilling into the way we live, into lifestyle. So in terms of that movement into the earth, we're seeing that again now. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think it looks different? Do you think it looks different because of the technology and the resources we have to create different colors, or the trends are different for some reason. Why is this, does this return to nature look completely different, like you showed, as compared to the avocado grain? Because nobody, nobody wants to live back in the past. <laughs> you know, the times are different. The culture is different. So I would say you reach back to the past for inspiration, and you apply that into new materials, into new textures, because what existed 30 years ago is very different than what existed 50 years ago than what exists today. So it's really about reinvention. Uh, I think that's one piece of it. And maybe there's different, now I'm just riffing, you know, there's different <laughs> pieces of nature that you might be inspired by. Maybe you weren't looking at, um, was wellness a big focus then? Was, was that what we were talking about then? Were we talking about disconnecting and taking a walk into nature? We were certainly concerned about preserving the environment. That There's no question about that. Uh, clean Air, wasn't the Clean Air Act signed in the 70s as well? I believe it was. I mean, so I think there were different aspects. I don't know that we were thinking about a worldwide water shortage in the 70s, were we? So I think it depends on what's topical at the time, what the needs are of, of the culture at the time, maybe how we respond to it, but I would still go back to the reinvention of things that happened in the past and how do we reply them and make them current for today's culture and today's consumer and today's lifestyle. What do you think? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to an earlier question about how we've evolved in our relationship of color, um, it is such an interdisciplinary topic. You have the sciences, chemistry, physics, art, all coming together. And people with these various backgrounds have made amazing discoveries that have really transformed where we are today. And so what I always am drawn to with color is how our desire for it um, and understanding of it leads to all these other things um, almost accidentally sometimes, um, but it still, color is not something you can explain with a simple formula or even a set of rules like, say, geometry. So there's always this element of mystery that keeps us kind of going forward and searching and trying to answer, find more answers. So I guess color seems magical to me in that way. Like, I don't know how many other topics you could say that about. Um, or maybe I just have an affinity for it and <laughs> became a total convert when I started researching it. Um, but I do think it is unique in how it has led to so many discoveries through just people's interest in figuring it out. I had the pleasure of seeing the saturated exhibition and the nostalgia that um, it brought back to see the colors of the Max. 
and then seeing the new trends of how they are bringing those back again, um, how they're going back to their old colors, though the vibrancy was really interesting for me to see. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration or the, the ideas and the structure behind putting together the color uh, saturated exhibition? Sure. Um, it started with that smaller show, and the reason I took on this topic that I naively took on and probably wouldn't have took on if I knew how complicated it was. Um, I knew Cooper Hewitt had this great color collection. Um, and I have the luxury of also borrowing books from Smithsonian Library's other 20 branches. Um, so when you combine all of our branches together, we really have the best of the best and have a definitive color collection. Um, so I was posed with a challenge of picking a topic that could show the breadth and depth of all of Smithsonian libraries. And here we have history, science, art, and culture, and what on earth brings all those together? Well, nothing better than color. <laughs> so it just became this perfect topic to talk about a lot of the different disciplines that we collect in. Um, and I still think it's a perfect topic for Smithsonian to explore beyond Cooper Hewitt's walls. I mean, there's so much potential it could have at the Air and Space Museum or American History. Um, color is such a malleable, flexible topic that people are just captivated and drawn to. Um, so that's how the topic came about. The small exhibition was seen by Susan Brown, Associate Curator of Textiles here, who I co-curated, saturated with. She was like, why don't we bring it up to Cooper Hewitt and put objects next to these great theory books that demonstrate the theory that the book is talking about. And it was perfect in my mind to you know, be able to learn these lessons on color theory, which aren't always the easiest things to learn. And we certainly get into areas of science that after page two, I'm lost. You know? <laughs> um, but if you have an object there that demonstrates iridescence after you've talked about how there's no pigment there at all. It's just refracting and reflecting wavelengths. Um, uh, it's, it, it became a real educational experience to have the two working together. I'll reveal something I probably shouldn't, but um, I was so fascinated, the team will remember, I was so fascinated that I actually ran into the glass and I left a face mark unsaturated. <laughs> I was, I was really? hoping they'd forgotten, but I'll remind them. That's really funny. Oh, yeah. Not, not funny at the time, but yeah. I love that. I was, I was looking at the color books. I ran it. We can come in person and page through. It's hard, Safer, it's hard to way. view a book under glass. I mean, the, yeah. the hard part is picking one page to show. Yeah. Um, we had some rotations of pages, but yes, there's it, they're full of more great images. <laughs> <laughs> so what, um, as we talk about synthetics and technology, um, what is the timeline and evolution of humans' use of um, pigments and dyes? We, or, or I and my limited knowledge, see it as the ultimate biomimicry in a way to create mm -hmm. something that represents nature. What's the history of that? Hey, pigments. <laughs> um, there was a textile found, I think, somewhere in South America in the last couple of years that is one of the oldest examples, including dyes. I forget if it was indigo, but textiles don't live a long time. Um, they break down, but people who know textiles just kind of innately know that people have been dyeing textiles a lot longer than we have textiles to show examples of. So to some people, it was like, oh my god, we've been dyeing things for tens of thousands of years. Like, this technology is so old. And to Susan, the textile person, she was like, of course we have. Like, <laughs> um, But yeah, I mean, our just fascination with color and wanting to reproduce it has been there for from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> That's history question. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I'm right there with you. I agree with you. What, what's the case for synthetic dyes? What, what is the reason that we need synthetic dyes? Why are they important in, 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 in color and playing with color and design? Well, all I could think about when you were talking about the snail, I'm going, wow. Not only is that expensive, <laughs> wow. How could you ever 
commercially reproduce that. You couldn't, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Impossible, and I think the world in which we live in today, from a manufacturing point of view, you need a way to commercialize something. So, of course, you don't wanna create synthetic dyes that are poisonous to the environment, and I can't speak for every dye company, the dye stuff that we use, we don't create our own dyes. We have to be very sure that they're as sustainable as possible. I don't know if that's the right way to put it. We have to adhere to different standards in different countries, so we have to be responsible. I've been with Pantone for almost 20 years. It's been like that since I've been there. But standards continue to get stricter and stricter about what chemicals you can and cannot use. Uh, and we have to live up to the highest bar because our, our clients are global. So it's about commercialization. It's about creation and commercialization, period, end of story. I, I think there's a big case for natural dyes, absolutely, and the, and the whole look of crafts, and if that's a path you wanna go down, I think it's great. I, I think the both can coexist. I don't think it's one or the other. It's hard to imagine, too, not like having every color at your fingertip and going back to limited palettes based on just what you can get from the earth, in a way. I, you know, now we're used to it, so. Going the other way, I don't know what would happen. <laughs> and is, is, isn't that in a way how artists hundreds of years back showed the wealth that they had by, by being able to create and use those colors because they were so expensive or, or mm -hmm. volatile or, or difficult? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, different colors had a higher value than silver or gold mm -hmm. at times in history. So it, color is a commodity, um, so it could be very influential in that way, too. Lori, I know the Pantone created the skin tone deck. Um, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about that journey? I'm assuming it wasn't a straightforward one. We created the skin tone deck uh, at request originally with Sephora. And I don't remember what year that started, maybe 2014? I forget. But their goal was to be able to use one of the machines by our parent company, x right that could measure somebody's skin tone and from there be able to advise them what color makeup would work for their complexion, their eye color, their hair color, et cetera. So in order for us to be able to come up with something that they could then you know, hold to your skin and measure, we, we had to come up with what are all the different skin tones out there. So of course, you're never gonna be able to come up with a guide Every single person has a different skin tone, period, end of story. Your skin tone on your face is different than the skin tone on your arm. You look at all the intermarriage, interrelationships, all the different cultures around the world. We tried to come up with what we felt would be a representation, and the way they did it was they took a sample size, I don't remember what the data set was, and measured people's skin tones, and then tried to come out with, forgive me, a tonal story <laughs> in skin tone so that there was enough of a range. But uh, a lot of the... Cosmetic companies have used that, I'm calling it a colorimeter, I don't really remember what it's called anymore, I should, don't. <laughs> but have used it specifically for that reason, for really, for beauty, to advise people on, on what would be the most flattering. If you almost think about it as an update from those books that were out years ago, the sp you're a spring, you're a summer, or fall, or winter, whatever it is, so a little bit more current version of that kind of thing. I've, I've seen it in practice. <laughs> Does it work? I mean, Sephora was very happy with it, you know, at the time, and a lot of other companies continue to use it, so I have to imagine it fulfills a certain segment of the population. I certainly think the range needs to be expanded, there's no question. Okay, perfect, we'll open it up to the audience if the audience has any questions. Hello. Um, one, that movie was wonderful. This is, I've been sitting here entranced. This is really a wonderful evening in general. Um, my question is, in anything, I feel like we said human nature is to go back into nature. One of the things that I think is in human nature is to go forward, like that bold, I'm going to see what else is out there, that cosmic curiosity. What is there a process or what is the process of wanting to see are there colors that we don't know yet? You know, like technologies where we are sensing light on spectrum that we, you know, maybe the eye hasn't done or we're just now coming to terms with. What is that? Like, what is that like? I'm very curious. Oh, is that for me? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely yeah, not for me. It, right? yeah. <laughs> I think that, and yes, 
there's a gamut of colors that the eye can see. There's a gamut of colors that can then be made up in print. There's a gamut of colors you might see on, in technology. Uh, on the Pantone side of it, yes, people are always discovering new colors. The challenge for us is can we reproduce those colors? So for example, we worked with LG recently. They were introducing an OLED television or wanted to reinvigorate this OLED television. We ended up doing a cafe pop-up down in Soho. What they really came to us for is can we create the blackest black like Vanta Black? And from what we had, and to reproduce this in an ink format, it just wasn't, we couldn't do it. And that's the thing. So the challenge is, yes, there's always going to be new colors you're going to discover. There's so many colors out there. Uh, but what can you physically reproduce? And for us, in, as somebody who's a standardized language of color, our palettes are only as good as our client's ability to commercially reproduce those colors simply and effectively on the materials they're applying them to. But yes, yeah, so I don't know from a technological standpoint, what the process is like to discover new colors, because I'm not sitting in that space. But I do think people are always on the lookout for that. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Cool. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of, you said uh, Pantone's obviously not political, but I think colors being so culturally based can mean very different things to very different like people depending on their background. So can you talk a little bit about kind of how you deliver a trend report um, or create a color every year, but also keep it kind of culturally sensitive or culturally agnostic? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am definitely apolitical here. Uh, I represent Pantone, but I do want to touch on a funny story and then I'll, I'll get back to the topic. You know, the team selects the Pantone color of the year. This is not a marketing exercise for us. This for us is a very pure feeling. This is what we see. This is what we believe. We don't have anything vested. We're not selling paint. I'm sharing that with you because when we were sharing the color of the year with a colleague in Germany who was not involved in it, she said, oh, that's the color of our garbage trucks. This was tangerine tango. So, you know, that's just, that was just the funny side. That's not about being culturally sensitive, that it could be offensive. But when we think about, so let's talk about trend reports versus color of the year. We do forecasting. Our largest, we do forecasting for uh, clients, so consultative, which could be anywhere from three to five years out, which is definitely a distance out there, those projects are tailored based on the culture, based on the market, based on you know everything that they're looking for. So I think cultural sensitivity is definitely taken into account uh, for that. I just had a client, we're working on a new cosmetics line, which is crossing cultures and really having to be very knowledgeable about how a certain color is gonna resonate, let's say a particular shade of gold uh, in the Middle East versus how that same shade of gold would resonate in the UK could be completely different. One culture has a preference for one kind versus another culture. So you have to be really culturally aware. I don't know if it's about being political, it's just as it's really, as you say, cultural sensitivities to what is interesting to people, intriguing to people, what they feel is relevant. When we get into our trend books, it is a global team. Uh, Pantone View Color Planner is our one that goes furthest out. That's 18 to 24 months. You have a cross. You have a range of people sitting there making the contribution. I think it's also very pure, based on what's happening. Spring Summer 21 is Botanica. So I talked about Spring Summer 20, but Spring Summer 21 is also very obviously Botanica, very nature based. But I don't know that anybody is sitting on the team going, "Wow, that yellow is not going to work," and you know. China or something like that. I think we're sensitive with names. We're sensitive with color of the year, but color of the year is not a forecast. It's what I would call a report back, using an old ready-to-wear term, because it's really a reflection of what we see taking place. It's something that we see happening across all these different areas around the world, across all these different uh, design influences, travel, new media, new technology, lifestyles, play styles, social values. So I don't know Political things enter into the picture, but they don't enter into the picture as a person. They enter in more in terms of, I hate to use this word, the chaos caused or the stability that results from versus a particular person. That was very long-winded, but did it help, did it help to answer? <laughs> Are you going to ask me another question? Hello. 
Hello, thank you. Um, would you happen to know if there is a such thing as a color therapist for health and wellness? And if this doesn't exist, perhaps it should? Of that. <laughs> um, just so happens that our curatorial assistant in her building is a color therapist. <laughs> so when we were doing our research, she got friendlier with her neighbor and was like, what is that all about? And she sat through a session and it was like nothing I had expected. It's not like she sat in the room bathed in red light, although I'm sure there's that color therapy out there too. Um, but this was more of like um, almost a hypnosis where it jogged the memory to an early memory. Um, I forget the steps involved, but you know, she was describing a beach and the ocean and the colors that she saw. And it all came down to identifying that she was terrified of rats from her move to New York. <laughs> um, and because she had this uncontrollable fear of mice or rats. And she never had that before. She grew up on a farm in Ohio. She was like, why am I scared of them now? And through this one therapy session, <laughs> she identified what her problem was and then also identified a color that she would focus on when she had these feelings. And that color, I forget how they came to it, but it ended up being silver for her. So when she got anxious with this fear, she would breathe silver, whatever that means. <laughs> but it helped and worked and sounded like a fascinating process. <laughs> There is a whole like school of thought. I forget the name of the person who started this. That like people are being trained. It's spreading. I don't know how widespread it is at this, point. Um, but it, it's out there. Hi. Um, my question is more along the lines of, um, in terms of how color in terms of association, because I heard quite a bit of reminiscing with avocado green and harvest gold, and at the same time, I wouldn't call it polarizing, but many people have very distinct memories of those two colors, especially if they grew up with it. But then I, it made me think about how I've met a lot of people where they now associate honeysuckle, which was 2011's it color, with uh, it's one of my favorite colors, by the way. Um, but thing is that with thing is that with the women's march movement, because so many of the knitted hats were in varying shades of honeysuckle. But the and then I could, and I'm thinking about the gentleman's question in the back about cultural sensitivity and cultural awareness. The, is there any colors that you've come out that have you seen within the past decade or two decades that you can you can foresee a degree of like of like that sharp like you know connection of an association for like millennials and future generations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think to me that's a question of shifting perception. You know, it's a cultural sensitivity, but it's about how do we shift perception? We worked with the UN. I think it was also 2014 to help them come up with a color for a movement called He for She, and it was about men. Uh, joining with women to protest treatment against women. And it was a red-based pink that we used. And you started to see at that point pink really being labeled as protest pink. Uh, and that was before the whole, you know, the whole pink hat thing. So we'd already started to begin to see that shift on the hot pinks. And I do think there are definitely cultural connections, like you said, the visceral connection to the avocado green and the harvest gold. I do think that pink has become associated with it. I think you could say the white for the suffragette movement. You know, when you started to see, I guess in 2016, uh, and even this last in the US, at the last Congress was it, where all the women wore white in, in solidarity for the women's movement. So I do think there's cultural connections that we keep with color. And, and there's more you could get into. But are you asking them what'll happen in the future? Oh, no, I'm just thinking like, or, Or they get a very, or you notice a very sharp reaction to it. Like 
And I, and I think it goes back to the color therapy thing. And I yeah. think, you know, when I think about Lee Eisman, who's the executive director of the Pantone Color Institute, one of the first things I did when I came to Pantone, I also have a master's in psychology, which was probably helpful, which I didn't know coming into my role. <laughs> it was just done because I wanted to do it. And the first thing I did was read some of her books. And she has a great book called Colors for Your Every Mood. And it really starts with almost what that color therapy person is suggesting, so many different things, and closing your eyes, and what do you think about, and what makes you happy, what makes you sad, bring you back to times, maybe your favorite colors, because your favorite teacher wore it, or you know your mother wore it, and you loved your mother, or she went to a party, and she loved that dress, something. But I do think there are visceral reactions to certain colors that we may not always know why they happen. That therapy is very rooted in memory, too, mm -hmm. and kind of treats color as the first language we learn because we'll see it before we have words. And that makes sense. Um, uh, thank you. Um, honestly, it was great, really interesting. I, I didn't think about it, many of those things. I'm desperately trying to remember, remember the name of that movie about Anna Latour, you know, the one where she does that really withering and um, put down of the girl who doesn't take color seriously. Because, thank you, the devil wears Prada, because that's what I kept thinking about when you were talking. Yeah, devil wears Prada moment. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've got a bit of a who, why question, and a who, how question. So thinking about just how important what you're saying is and all the ways in which color provides access to meaning and gives us ways to connect and all of that type of thing. Who do you think would be, who, like if you were in charge, hypothetically, not that I am, but if you were in charge of design, uh, of, uh, design education, right? Uh, who would you put, who would you think would be best placed to, um, to get, who would be the right people to have design students work with in order to become more color literate, for want of a better word? You know, who are the right people for them to be thinking, talking to, working with, and learning about color with? That's my question. Well, uh, I guess in my research, I've been fascinated how long of a life Albers has had with his interaction of color. It has been the standard sort of in higher ed and beyond when it comes to teaching art and design students about color. Along also with Johannes Eaton's book as well, so both coming out of the Bauhaus. Um, I have pondered why there hasn't been, I mean, that's from 1963, certainly technology has changed, we've come a long way, we have had a lot of other experiences, but yet when it comes to the education of color, we seem still there, and I welcome any <laughs> input from a student or somebody who has, you know, learned otherwise. Great. <laughs> um, one story that I loved from our rare books is the story of Milton Bradley of board game fame. He also was an art supply manufacturer and wrote a book called Elementary Color. He also created tools that measured color. Um, but he was very adamant that the, you should teach color to young children. Like the younger they are when you teach them color, just like an instrument, say a musical instrument, the younger you learn it, the better you'll be able to speak the language of color as you grow up. So that too seemed like this revolutionary idea in a way with mm -hmm. color. But what contemporarily is happening, I'm curious, I saw a hand. <laughs> My name is Savannah. Uh, I graduated from Pratt Institute last year, and I studied communications design. And um, I also did a minor in photography. But we had a foundation year in our first year at Pratt where we did an entire year of light and color design class that was six hours long, two days a week. So we really went in depth into color, everything from studying classic paintings to collecting leaves and reinterpreting the colors to the exact of that leaf to drawing an egg with red, yellow, and blue. So we like, we really studied color. We painted, um, we painted flames. We saw, you know, we, we really, really went into it. Um, we did pointillism and, uh, 
We reinterpreted famous paintings, painting them exactly, or painting them in blocks with different colors, painting them from different approaches. We were only allowed to use like six colors throughout the entire year, but in, in our paints, in our acrylic paints, and we had to figure out ways to combine those colors to create every single color in the gamut. And we even did um, a full Pantone color project where we had to make our own like hexagon color wheel with all the different colors and how they connect together and figure out kind of like the science between, you know, purple and green and how does that eventually make black and everything in between. So it was pretty amazing. We weren't even allowed to use black. We had to make our own black with purple and green. So it was, it was a great education on color. And I'm sure every art school has something in that vein, but we took our time to really learn color. And I've seen it go into my career in this first year out of school so many times where I'm like looking back on that first year of school five years ago and remembering all the things that I learned. So this has been a great, great update on that. And I love for sharing. Hearing. That's great. I'm glad to hear Pat's doing that. I gave a lot of tours to a lot of students and a lot of them maybe had one class in right. a semester right. on color. Right. So maybe we're shifting back to putting more attention on it. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Maybe it depends on the school too. I'm, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm the same with you. Yeah. I've gotten complaints from the teachers that they, they don't yeah. feel the kids are doing enough. Hi. Um, so one of the things, one of the questions I've had all along while watching the film and beyond that is, um, and now that I know that you have a master's in psychology, this is an especially good question for you. Um, I'm interested in the collective unconscious when it comes to color. Why you might like um, be walking down the street and all of a sudden have a craving for a certain color. I want to wear it or I want, I'm a photographer, I want to use this in my work. And then you start seeing it everywhere over the next few months. And then it's at H&M, and then it's at Sephora, and you sort of feel like you could feel it coming on. Um, I do come from an art background, but I, I think it can't just be me. And I'm wondering about the collective, like how, how that plays into color as a culture, as people, as people experiencing color, as people consuming color, as people craving color? I don't know how to answer that, because I, I, I honestly don't, because I, I feel like sometimes things just click, and that thing could be in your environment, and you're not aware of it, and all of a sudden, once you become aware of it, you just become really attuned to what's going on. That's probably the best thing I could describe it, and maybe you do have some kind of prescience, that could be there as well. Maybe you're not aware of that. Maybe that comes from, even though you don't think you're conscious of it, somehow it has entered into, as you say, your collective unconscious, and it's not until it comes into consciousness that you're aware, but I, I don't know how I would label that. I would say people that are in the world of forecasting, though, typically are very attuned to what's going on. Uh, and I would say have that kind of a skill set because some of it is, is observational skills as well, but really being able to connect the dots. Is that what you were going to say too? Uh, I'll just comment real quickly. Yeah, because you I may have a better answer. Yeah, I saw me. I'm sorry. So we develop products, and uh, products have a, it takes time for them to come out. 12 to 14 months is a production cycle. So what you're probably experiencing is you're seeing the forerunners. They've hit upon an interesting color that hasn't been out for a while. They're the first ones to market. So you'll see it here, there. And suddenly, those products will start selling. So store and chain buyers for the bigger stores will request that color in a product. And in the companies, usually larger scale companies that are six months behind the curve, eight months behind the curve, will suddenly mass market that color because the trendy people are doing it. And it runs through a secondary cycle and then it repeats again and again. So there's kind of like a really boring technical reason for that and it has to do with awareness and production cycles in industry. Thank you for that. I wasn't looking at it from a retail cycle and I guess that was probably a much better way to answer it. 
So thanks. Yeah, no, 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 but that's. Thank you for all of your questions. I think that's all we have time for tonight. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you.